Hey everybody, Andy here, helping you build a career you love. Thursday Live Office Hours, glad to have you with me. Got a great one for you today on 12, count them 12, recruitment, lies, myths, mayhem, all kinds of crap you wish you knew. So I'm gonna run through all of it. Actually, it's really more than 12, but I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of things I want you to know and a whole bunch of things I want you to do about these truths. I, I speak the truth today, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this. I think it'll, it will shed a lot of light on things that are usually very confusing in the overall recruiting, hiring, interviewing. We're going to cover it all today. So if you're here with me live, get in the chat, say hi, let me know who you are. Let me know where you're from. Let me know what you do. Let me know what you need. Put some question marks in front of those questions so I can find them. So when we're done with the package, we can go to the Q&A. I got a little something extra special today too about uh, something I'm going to be doing tomorrow. I'm going to fill you in on that too at the end. But great to see everybody. Everything looks good. I got a green connection, so I'm going to go. All right, what's this all about? Well, in the interviewing process, in the hiring process, overall job search stuff, executive recruiters, corporate recruiters, there's a lot of questions that I get week in, week out, day in, day out uh, from job seekers wondering what's up. So I got 12 little beauties. This is gonna be a, this is what it is. Here's what you can do about it. I got pink cards today because I was feeling kind of colorful. All right, here we go. This first one's like a three or four bagger, right? All, all, all together. But here, here's the first one. You got some mystery people in the process. I'm gonna tell you who they are. We're gonna talk about what happens when things change, when, when, when companies change priorities and database padding. So let's, let's hit a few. I wanted to take the first one as a questions that I get a lot about, Andy, why am I getting ghosted? Why did somebody contact me on LinkedIn and I responded back very nicely and they never got back to me? All of, all of that good stuff. Okay, so let's, I want a couple things. Let's talk about when somebody reaches out to you initially. So here you are minding your own business, stalking who's looking at your LinkedIn profile, and you get, boom, you get this nice little LinkedIn message. It could be from an executive recruiter, so a third-party search firm person, or it could be from a corporate recruiter, right? Hey, I'm Kara. I work at Milewalk. I'm the corporate recruiter. We're looking to hire somebody kind of thing. All right. Now, one of the things you got to know is a lot of companies... Uh, use researchers. Uh, researchers are not the recruiters. There are people who look over the internets all over the place, usually LinkedIn, and they try to find people whose backgrounds look like individuals that they would like to hire or their clients would like to hire or their company would like to hire uh, for particular positions. Now, the researchers, as you can imagine, are not as skilled at looking at profiles as a, as a recruiter or an executive recruiter might be. And so what they do is they, they, they go through, they get a job description, they look for some keywords, they do some searching on LinkedIn, they send you a message and they say, hey Henry, uh, we've got this great opportunity over at my company. Would you be interested in talking? And then Henry gets all excited, starts doing backflips, immediately sends a message back and says, yes, I'd be happy to, to go and, and interview with you. And then Henry doesn't hear anything. And then Henry comes to my live office hour show and he's like, Henry, why did I get ghosted? Well, here's likely what happened. Well, here's one or two scenarios. The little old researcher thought your background was okay, sent you a message, and even if she or he was not certain, it's better for them to send it and see what happens and get your reaction. Then you got back to the, you got back to, to her, she turned to the corporate recruiter and says, hey, I got this guy, Henry, and the corporate recruiter looked at your background and said, he doesn't fit my position, um, so, so don't respond to him, okay? That's one scenario. Another scenario that you cannot control is they might have had other candidates in the process that are now engaged, and that recruiter has got to move on to another position, in which case they're not sure what they wanna do with Henry, and even though Henry's interested, they don't wanna you know, upset the apple cart because they have candidates that are moving through the pipeline. Okay, so, so that could happen. Now, we've worked for organizations, and when I say we worked for organizations, I mean Milewalk, my executive search firm, has done executive recruitment for companies 
I could think of one immediately comes to mind. They had a four person recruitment staff, corporate recruiters, and each one of those recruiters had a researcher that was doing these things. So this is a quite a common occurrence and it's especially common in executive recruiting. And what's happening with you is you're seeing an inbound message that's likely coming from the recruiter's account, not the researcher's account. And the reason they do that is because they know you're gonna look at the profile of the person who sent you the message and you're gonna get all excited and think, oh my goodness, that's a corporate recruiter who's, re who's recruiting for the sales positions. Or that's the, an executive recruiter who looks like he's got a lot of great clients and you hustle back to them and, and those kind of things can happen. So the researcher uh, you know, really isn't equipped maybe, and it doesn't mean anything's wrong with your profile, it's just that maybe that didn't match exactly what they needed or what the recruiter was looking for. Maybe the priorities changed, but I'm telling you that there are a lot of people out there that you don't really know are operating accounts for people you think you're interacting with. Okay, what, I don't know what they call that, like on, uh, like, like in a, it was a catfishing or something like that, in a, just a terrible sense on some of these sites when people do that, but that's, that's actually what's happening in most cases. Now, the database padding part. If you get an executive recruiter who reaches out to you and you, and you are getting back to that person and that person is then going to have a conversation with you and asks you up front, uh, or says to you, uh, hey, in order for me to proceed with you, I, uh, I'd like to get some references for you. Under no circumstances should you ever give them references because at that point, all they're doing is they're padding their database with other people that they likely will call and try to recruit. So, so I just want you to know, these things occur up front. It becomes um, very difficult for you to know what's happening. But the one thing that I want you to do in these cases is I do want you to respond when you get inquiries like this. But the thing I would really like for you to do is to not, not worry and think I'm getting ghosted, think my profile sucks, think why doesn't anybody love me. You have absolutely no idea what's going on behind the scenes in these situations. All right, so that that's number one, all right? This is... This is the real thing here. All right, this really, really happens. Uh, okay, number two. Uh, let's call this one the abandoned ATS and doing it backwards. How are we doing? Can my team give me a, a shout? Like everything is, is going pretty good. All right, the abandoned ATS and doing it backwards. What do I mean? Do you know how I sit here every week? Forget that. I sit here every day and you guys ask me, Andy, you know, What's a good percentage match and job scan and your, yeah, I want to put my resume in the applicant tracking system and I made, I put it in 400 different places and nobody's getting back to me and Andy sits here and he tells you, well, you know, you only got, you know, really tiny, itty bitty, like ten, super nano microscopic possibility of getting seen. That's true. But you know what else I, I, I don't know that I've ever told you that's actually true? is that a lot of companies don't look at any of the ATS submissions at all, zero, never look, okay? Legit, never look. Here's, 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 what, here's what I can tell you. This is, this is a stat that might make you cry. Uh, MileWalk, executive search firm again, MileWalk, has worked for more than 200 companies, okay? And in those companies, we've recruited for a variety of positions, different levels, different size companies, and I would say conservatively that over 50% of them did not what we call farm the ATS, meaning, meaning, meaning applications are going in and half of the companies aren't even looking at any of the applications coming in. And they usually do that for a couple of reasons, why they're, why they're not paying attention to what's going in the, in, inside the applicant tracking system. Because most companies have been conditioned to see and discover that it's better for them to go out and try to deliberately recruit individuals that they would like based on profiles they have set up and that 
the pool of candidates is bigger if they can reach out to individuals and that the pool of candidates is much smaller if they're only looking at their applicant tracking system. And what makes it even worse for them is most of the people who submit their resumes into the applicant tracking systems are not qualified for those particular positions. So the employers get bummed out. They burn a lot of time looking through a lot of resumes if they even bother, recognizing that there's not a lot of qualified people for what they're looking for or what they truly want. So they do a couple of things. Either they have recruiters who are looking and reaching out. I, I worked with one organization that had an eight recruiter staff for a comp a, 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 an organization within the Chicagoland area that only had a hundred people in the Chicago office. So they would, they would constantly be building relationships and they didn't pay any attention to any of the applicant tracking system uh, submissions. They did everything proactively and additionally they would supplement that with hiring executive recruiting firms like Milewalk or others to with, with particular niches or sweet spots to recruit the individuals that they wanted mostly at the senior level but even at the mid-levels if they needed a lot of them and they were difficult to find. So a lot of times you're submitting your resume and no one is looking and you're wondering, well, I'm qualified. Why am I not even getting, you know, I, I scored super high on job scan and I'm really, I'm really a fit. A lot of times they're not looking at all. And I, I bet you I can get a holler here in the chat for a bunch of people who, you know, you went in through a boss hunting technique that I've given you, or you've gone in through an employee referral, you've gone into the process, maybe had a phone screen, a text screen or something like that. And then the... The employer says, hey, would you would you mind putting your 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 resume into the applicant tracking system for us? We need it, you know, for legal reasons and all that good stuff. So that's a lot of times what's what's happening. So that's even further diluting your ability to be seen. It's pretty, it's 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 pretty pretty common. It's pretty common. So so I want you to I want you to know that. All right, number three. It only took me one take to get this card. Okay, this is what the world looks like. There are always jobs and most of them you don't see. This is what you think the pool of open jobs is and this over here is the reality of how many jobs are actually available. 80% or nearabouts of, of job openings are not publicized. What do I mean? A lot of times companies will hire on the sly. They will hire they don't want to advertise because they want to reach out, especially for niche positions. Okay. The other thing is that you have to you have to re realize this that even if a company doesn't hire to grow, a thousand person company with a ten percent turnover annually, that's ten, right? Ten for a hundred. That's a hundred positions a year that they have to hire for because people leave or they want to replace them, or they want to upgrade their team members. Okay, so, so and then start adding zeros on those numbers. So a lot of times, companies are hiring and replacing people or adding, even adding additional positions that they don't, they don't always advertise. It is, there's not a rule that you have to advertise uh, an open position. There are some legalities in some situations, but a lot of companies hire without publicizing their positions. So, much like I yell in the recruiter's ears and employer's ears, don't just farm your applicant tracking system because your candidate pool is so small because then it's only limited to active candidates who are seeking you out. Go out after everybody in the world. What do I always say to the job seeker? Don't limit yourself to open job positions and what you can see that's available. You're only limiting yourself to what you're seeing on the internets, right? So, so go after any company you want, right? Companies go after any person they want. You should do the same thing. Okay. All right. Now, ooh, I burned this one early. Number four. Mm. Number four. Recruiters will tell you anything you want to know, but you have not because you ask not. Okay, you don't have the, we got any Bible lovers? James 4, 2, right? There are no secrets. I'll tell you what you want to know. Just ask me, okay? Honest to goodness. Now, I've given you a lot of questions to ask recruiters in your upfront screens, 
But if I was given my choice of priorities and I only had 20 seconds to ask a recruiter my questions, how long has the position been open? How many people have you interviewed for this position for its lifetime? How many are still alive? Where did they come from? Right? Are there any internal candidates? Why isn't the position filled yet? What is the date by which you need somebody to start? What happens if somebody does not start on that date? Those are my eight. Okay, so, so are you getting that information? Are you getting that information? Think about what that will do for you. Andy, they're not getting back to me. They haven't responded quickly. Did you ask them when they had to fill the position? When does somebody need to start? What was the impact? We one time had a client, I will never forget this. I had a client, she calls me up. This is a client I love. Calls me up, said, Andy, we need some help. We, we, we are looking for this architect and uh, you know she does one of these, boom, on the phone. Like, I'm sorry I didn't call you two months ago. Three months we've been looking, can't find anybody, we need you. No problem. First question I asked her, how much money are you, are you losing out on by not having this person? First question. That was, I didn't even ask her, I didn't even ask her what she wanted. How much money are you losing out on? Well, uh, you know, it's a $300 an hour resource that we could be charging. So now it's three months you don't have the person. And 300, I don't know, let's do the fast math, right? $300 an hour, 600 grand a year, 50 grand a month, 2,200 and change a day. $2,200 a day they're not getting because somebody is not in the seat. You think they're motivated? They ended up paying two and a quarter for somebody they probably could have gotten for 165 or 175,000 on some other given day. Do you think that they actually cared that they paid $50,000 more than they would have hoped they would have paid for somebody where they were losing 50 grand in revenue a month. Glass door's not gonna tell you what that rate's supposed to be on that given day, right? So you gotta do away with market pay. You need to understand motivation. Your actions speak so loudly I can't hear what you're saying, right? They're not getting back to you. Well, did they tell you that this is a real luxury position? We don't really need somebody. It would be nice because we want to expand. Nothing harmful is really happening to us because we don't have somebody in the seat. Or $2,272 a day I do not get. There's a huge difference. You will start to look for the consistencies. Are they operating in a behavior that is consistent with what they tell you? Are you asking the right questions? So make sure you're Make sure you're asking those. Okay, what do we got here? All right, number five. The salary is not what they tell you up front. They are not actually lying to you. They are telling you what they think they want to pay for the particular job. Or if they're asking you, there's Ginger. If, you're, if they're asking you what you're expecting or you say to them what's your budget and they say the position pays 70000 All right, I want to give you a quick one here. So uh, every time you, they say this or you ask them what the job pays or it's publicized, heaven forbid, on the job description that says this pays $70,000. That's what they think they can pay for what they think they want done. And every single company, this, is, this goes for any position in any company in any country at all times forever and ever. There's always two variables. When at the beginning of the, of the hiring process, the problem the company needs to solve, the problem they have, and who they think can solve it, okay? The who they think can solve it, they put in their head, this is a job description of the traits of the person and what the person looks like and about how old they are and about how many years of experience and what that experience is and what they've done before and so on and so forth. And for that, I'm either used to paying 70, I think I want to pay 70, I only have $70,000 or whatever. Is okay. Now the to do on your end is that's fine and then you need to change not the problem that they have, but in their mind who they think can solve the problem, that would be you, how you would solve it even better than they thought, and the value you can contribute even more than they had hoped for, which is why you're going to cost them 100 not 70. Okay, so you have the whole interview process to change their mind and change their views. And that's a lot of time for you to be able to do that. 
okay? But a lot of you throw in the towel because you heard something that threw you off your game or disappointed you right out of the shoot. Don't do that. Don't do that. Change their mind if you want it badly enough. Now, like I always say, if you're really busy, you make a ton of money and you like your job, then you don't want to kick the tires, that's fine. But assuming you want to get engaged and you want to get into this, that's what you want to do. All right, next one. I got news for you, and I think a lot of you know this. The most qualified candidate does not always win, and in many cases, doesn't even usually win. Okay, so 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 what do I what do I what do I mean here? Well, this is this is kind of a simple one. You know, I know the boss. I know the boss's boss. I I you know I'm dating the whatever. I you know the relationships. I was an employee referral from so and so. True true story. My wife she wants a new car. Um, you know, we talk to a neighbor. Neighbor knows a friend at the dealership, who's the owner. Owner says to somebody else, go talk to these people. I didn't have to put a deposit down. I didn't have to put anything down. I didn't have to run anything. Boom, boom, boom. Right? Ordered a new car or whatever it was that she wanted. And it's like that in life. Right? So so remember that. Remember that. And it, then it comes down to, okay, all things being equal, level playing field. Is your communication better? The, can you articulate your fit and value and align it and connect the dots for them based on what they need. And we're going to get into some of these other ones and how to, and how to help you do that. So, so remember that. Here's another one. Do not ever assume that they know who they're looking for. Okay, we know who we're looking for. We, 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 we know who we seek. Okay, you have not because you asked not. Here's another one for you. Don't assume they actually know. And even if they tell you that they do know doesn't mean they all think the same thing about what's been defined for who they seek. So one, one thing that you should be getting up front, aside from those eight things that I rattled off, are make sure culture is a big thing with companies, it, and it should be, okay? It, you know, are you asking up front, do you have an internal list of cultural characteristics or corporate tenants or, you know, rules you abide by or things you want everybody to know or be or whatever. Do you, do you have something in, internally? Could you give that to me? If you can't give that to me, can you verbalize that to me? Can you give me those traits? You start with, it's really important for me to join an organization that is culturally aligned. I'm, I'm big on culture and I want to make sure that the way I operate is in tune with the corporate personality, the way the corporation operates. So I would love to see what your tenants are what your cultural components are, what your characteristics are. And then, okay, what does each one of these mean to you? And then you're, you're continually confirming that along the way with the, with, with, the in, with the interviewers to make sure that you are understanding what this particular interviewer thinks entrepreneurial looks like. Okay, what this particular interviewer thinks raising the bar looks like. Okay, customer service looks like. All right, so so that's another one. And how about this one? You guys know, you know I you know I beat the hell out of this one. That they actually know what success looks like. If they don't know what success looks like, I got news for you, you won't know what success looks like, and most of them do not consider success to be defined the same way for your particular position. And you have many people who are contributing to the success of you, your position and what your success means to them. So I might be your teammate, I might be your boss, I might be your internal customer, I might be your internal partner, I might be your external customer, and so on and so forth. Each one of those needs to define success for you. You need to look for the congruence across each. Does this one think success looks like this? Does that one think success looks like that? Wait, I'm okay with that even because what happens? Their own personal um, needs supersedes the needs of the company. So what do you need to do? Well, number one, you need to make sure you know what they think. And number two, then you need to talk to them about how you are going to make them successful based on their definition of it. Just because Henry over there wants this and Susie over there wants that, right? If you're trying to, if you're trying to you know, give Henry's parameters to Susie, that's not going to work. So you need to make sure that you're being consistent and you need to ask that question to every interviewer. If, if, if you were to hire me, what would you think success would look like? I'm your teammate. I'm your, I'm your subordinate, I get. You know, whatever it is. Okay? 
And then, oh, you, but, but, but you, know, you know this one already. They don't really know how to evaluate you. Okay, so, so, so now when you, when you look at, 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 at something like this, You've got to ask every person what's important to them, right? The success components, the cultural characteristics. You're, you need to look for consistency and you need to hammer home how you align to the job description based on what their interpretation of the job description. I want to say that again. Not everybody interprets the job the same way. So every time you're going into an interview with someone, you need to make sure that you in some way, shape, or form are getting an understanding from them as to how they view the job description. I'm telling you they're mostly not trained, right? They get paid to do something else, but a lot of these people get thrown into the interview process because these are the people that are ultimately going to hire you. But since they're not trained interviewers, what do you need to do to combat that? You need to make sure that you're connecting the dots of how you contribute value to the job description, to what success looks like, how you align to the culture, and you need to do that for each one of them. So, so you, need to be, you need to be hitting them. You need to be looking for the consistency, but you need to be hitting them with your stories that make the most sense for their interpretation of the job itself. And wait, and I got, I got, I got another one here. I got another one here on this. If... If they don't know how to evaluate you, you have to recognize that human nature will supersede any st uh, tactics in doing so. So let me give you, let me give you a, a little story here. The, we had a client, oh, beautiful client, large, super large food and beverage company. Might have been the largest privately held food and beverage company in, might be the world. And I would work with different units within the, you know, within the company. And I had an HR person that they were like an HR business partner that was responsible for helping to recruit career development and all this other good stuff. And inevitably, uh, most of our clients, as we got to work with them, they would all want me to come in and talk to their staff about interviewing and could you help come in and give us some best practices maybe maybe tutor some of the interviewers we were happy to do that because i wanted interviewers who knew how to interview and i wanted interviews interviewers who knew how to represent their companies and could sell their companies to my job candidates right we were all we were all on the same team and i would say i remember saying this to to one of the women uh look we're not going to lobotomize these people in an hour with me or even a day with me, right? So, so I know it's going to be a work in process and we're going to try to get them uh, into the right methods, into the right tactics. But you giving each interviewer a bunch of questions that they don't really understand until you can help them understand them, why they're asking them, what they're looking for, and so on, which is where we want to get to. In the absence of that, the fastest way for you to immediately improve your hiring process is you ask the test questions of the interviewer before the interviewer actually starts the interview. So let me be really clear. I'm not talking about you give the, the questions that you want your interviewers to ask to the job candidates, right? Because they bail on those questions, they don't really understand them. It, that's that's even worse. But if you go to the, to, for example, if you go to the person who's evaluating the teammate you say to that person, okay, Jack, when you're done interviewing Tammy, I'm going to ask you, is this somebody you want to work with? Is this somebody you feel you can learn from? Is this somebody you would want to teach? And is this somebody that has the right foundational abilities to develop the skills that you have? Or something like that. I'm going to ask you those four things, Jack. So when you're done, I'm coming right after you and I'm going to ask you those four questions. And inevitably what happens is, well, that's what Jack was going to, that's what he's going to be thinking anyway, except you're polluting his mind with questions he doesn't understand and he certainly doesn't know how to get the information he needs. Just let, let him go and have a conversation with that person and tell him what you're going to ask him. And immediately your focal point gets onto the stuff that you would have evaluated them on anyway. But wouldn't you want to know that as, an inter, as a job candidate? Right, that that's how they're gonna evaluate. That's what I gotta focus on. That's how my story's gotta connect with them. By the way, this this guy, it's this all this stuff is in here, right? This is how uh, those methods are in the hiring processes uh, are, are designed, and we 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 go into them in detail. 
So it's, 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 it's maybe a great idea for a lot of you job seekers to read the hiring book, even if you're not in a hiring capacity. So, so that's, that's another one. And then do not assume ever that they read your resume. I read your resume when I opened it two seconds ago. A lot of them are not prepared. A lot of times, that example I just gave you uh, from my food and beverage client, they, you know, you know, I, I would say to them, no, here's what here's what needs to be prepped, and we would we would give them preliminary lists of in, information that we needed them to know in advance. It had to come to them so many days in advance of the interview, and you needed to check with them before to make sure that they reviewed it so that they knew what was what. Most companies won't do that. Okay, most companies are printing your resume, running down the hall and jumping in the room where you are or or you're coming into their room. And and so you're you're talking to them a lot of times like they read your resume. So not only did they not even skim it, they barely looked at it. So you need to assume that they know nothing about you. Don't say, you know, oh, my name's Jack. No, my name's Jack Anthony. My name's whatever, right? Like you and I'm a whatever. And I'm here for this position. Don't even assume they know what position you're interviewing for. I mean, it's, I'm not kidding you. Don't even make that assumption. Half the time, they don't know. So just remember that. Here's another one. This is kind of a, a biggie. All right. They're not responding to me after I've gotten into the interview process. Andy, what's the, what's the deal? Well, you're waiting or, or they're chasing somebody or they're extending an offer to somebody and you want to know, when do I throw in the towel? Okay, so... Couple things here. If they're not responding, it is likely that they're doing one of a couple things. They're probably, they're probably interviewing other candidates. Now, you would know that if you asked them explicitly, right? What's the landscape look like? Who's gonna get back to me? By when? What's typically the next step? Are there any conditionals? Like, are you interviewing other people and you still need to select down the number? Or they're chasing the hiring official or hiring manager and they don't know when they're going to get back and they're waiting and they're not responding to you because they haven't been able to touch down with somebody. Now, you need. It, will there be any trouble getting in touch with whoever you need to get in touch with before you get back to me in three days or a week or two weeks or whatever? So that's happening. Or they're extending an offer to somebody else. Now, here's what you should do, although probably this sounds totally odd to you, but if I'm in an interviewing process, I would say, hey, Mr. Mr. Recruiter Man, uh, listen, what's the next step? By when's it going to happen? Who's going to contact me? So, are there any other you know, contingencies, variables, and things hanging out there? Well, we're interviewing other candidates, Andy. Great. Um, is it possible that you would be extending an offer to one of them before you got back to me. Because I want you to know, if that's the case, it's okay. Can you let me know if you extend an offer to somebody else? Because I want you to know that even if it doesn't work out with that person, I would still be open to making this work with you, even if you extended it to somebody else. What, What does that matter to me? I don't think in terms of second choice, right? God has a plan for me. I'll be where I'm supposed to be. Everything will turn out how, you don't have to go on all this, but you get what I'm saying, right? Let them know. They'll tell you, then you'll stop agonizing over what the hell's going on. But that happens a lot. Now, now what happens? Some of you, I know this because some of you were in my coaching program and you send me frantic emails at like 11 o'clock one night. You're like, Andy, hang on. I just got an offer, but they told me I have to respond to them tomorrow. Can we have a coaching call at 430 in the morning? Because I have to give them an answer by noon because they told me that they've got other candidates waiting and they want to make sure that they have my answer and before they let them go and so on and so forth. And Right? So get the information. What do you care? Let them know. And even if, the, even if that makes you bummed out and you feel like second fiddle or whatever, who cares? At least you know, right? I want to know. I don't always want to know, but in business, I always want to know, right? Kind of thing. In business, I always want to know. So just, just think about that. And then how long should you wait until you throw in the towel? If they are not getting back to you and they said they would in a couple days and it's a couple weeks, or they said a couple weeks and it's been a month, just email them and, and give them a kiss off email. Hey, I, you know, I really enjoyed meeting you. Uh, I wanted to check in to see if there was any update. Don't, don't worry, I ain't gonna keep pestering you. Just let me know if anything. And I would mentally have checked out. You're gone, you're history. I'm out of here, okay? So keep, keep that in mind, number 11. And number 12, people. 
They expect you to counter offer their initial offer. I know some of you are going to say, Andy, no, they gave me the offer, told me it was fast and final, and that's that. Employers always hold a little back. Why? Because they want to feel like the good guy. They know you're going to ask, so they want to have a little in reserve that they know they can do. Do you know, we've run surveys over the years, and I've even read other trainers and recruiters' surveys, and this is true. Uh, that, and I remember, th well, this was a few years ago, and the mile walk numbers even is like double this number. But even if you don't know what you're doing, e you don't even ask it the right way, you don't flower it up with all the angry language I give you and all that stuff, and you just say, I want more money. You have an, on average, statistical chance, if you are a white collar worker, of getting a $5,000 increase bump by just asking. Where's my card? You have not because you ask not. Wait, I'm almost there, right? It, even if you didn't know what you were doing, our, our statistical, the recruitment firm's statistical number is like over 12 or something like that on average. So some people might not have gotten it and some people got $50,000 counters, but you gotta ask, they expect it. Okay, so, so if they don't, if they don't give you more money, then, then it could be any one of a number of reasons, okay? I'm not saying this is always true, but generally speaking, they expect you to counter. So uh, it could be, you know what? You just didn't, you just didn't do that well. Uh, it could be, that's all the money they have. It's maybe they're nervous. They don't consider you a sure thing. It could be any one of a number of things. They're, they might be at, at a stage in their evolution where they just don't have the money or, the, or, or it would really you know, knuckle down their EBITDA or whatever it is. But they do, most of the time, expect you to counter. Don't get nervous that you think they're going to rescind the offer. And if something extreme happens, because it will, obviously, if, I mean, it, statistically, somebody might rescind an offer, they didn't really want you to work there in the first place. Nobody gets offended when you come back and ask for more money. And if they did, those aren't the kind of people you wanna work with, that's my view. All right, so I'm not recapping that because that was 36 minutes and I told myself I could get that thing done in 38. So I am not recapping it and I'm, I'm beating my budget today. So I hope you enjoyed that, those 12, I know you're, some of you are gonna wanna loop those eight questions because I said them super fast, but I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, if you are here with me now, we're gonna go, we're gonna go to the Q&A. And if you're watching this on the recording, so long and I'll see you next week.